Why don't we start in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the first letter of John, St. John. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is of God. Whoever loves is begotten by God and knows God. Whoever is without love does not know God, for God is love. In this way, the love of God was revealed to us. God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might have life through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God has loved us. The Gospel. Oh, sorry. The Word of the Lord. <laughs> um, so, I tell you what, just to start off... Um, hey, hi. Um, <laughs> were you waving at me? <laughs> oh, because I made the Calabrian joke? She's Italian, so she'll be... <laughs> cutting my tires after Mass. Um... So, um, I tell you what, just to start off, since love is a really huge theme in the Gospel of John, introduce yourself to the people around you, and we'll start in a second. So. <laughs> So why don't we start? So this is going to be um, a very long class on the Gospel of John. So we're going to go six weeks, three weeks, take one week break because I'll be out of town, and then come back again. And so the Gospel of John is very different from the Synoptic Gospels. The Synoptics are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The Gospel of John is, is this too loud? The Gospel of John is very, very different. It's sometimes called the Maverick Gospel because it's so much different than the other Gospels. In the Gospel of John, there's no parables, there's no exorcisms, there's no miracles in the Gospel of John. Um, John has different stories than the synoptics. He has the prologue and the wedding at Cana, uh, the discourse with Nicodemus on baptism, the Samaritan woman at the well, the man born blind, the rising of Lazarus, the adulterous woman, um, different resurrection appearances. Uh, And there's a lot that's missing from the Gospel of John than the other ones. Now, there's no infancy narratives, there's no childhood stories, there's no temptation in the desert, no Lord's Prayer, no list of the 12 apostles, no transfiguration, no parables, no exorcisms, fewer, very few ethical teachings, very few prediction stories, fewer uh, stories about the kingdom of God, and fewer stories about the second coming. So another difference is, like the synoptic gospels, all take place over one year. John's gospel, it takes place over three years. Um, In the synoptic gospels, um, Mark, Matthew, Luke, Jesus' ministry mostly focuses in Galilee, where everybody's from. You know, that's where the apostles were from. And then he moves to Jerusalem. John has Jesus uh, shuttled between Galilee and Jerusalem. He goes to this temple several times. In the synoptics, uh, Jesus' ministry starts after John the Baptist is arrested. In John, his ministry really starts even before John is arrested, uh, John the Baptist is. John is familiar with his synoptics viewpoint, but he adds a lot of details that aren't in the other Gospels. And he doesn't go over certain things because he knows it's in the other Gospel. Not only that, the Christology of John is different. Christology is a study of Christ. 
in Mark, um, like if you're reading the Gospels, you can kind of guess which, if I was to read a Gospel to you, it'd be easy to guess kind of what Gospel it is. Mark focuses on the suffering of Christ, his sacrifice. So you hear the word sacrifice and cross a lot in the Gospel of Mark. Um, Matthew, Matthew, Christ is the teacher. He's the prophet. And he, you have hundreds and hundreds of prophecies from the Old Testament. Um, it's very Jewish. Luke, I, I love the Gospel of Luke because it's the opposite of my personality. Um, really it is. Um, Jesus in the Gospel of Luke, as you know, it's ten meals. All he does is eat, drink, and tell stories. He loves the word hospitable, being hus hospitality and welcome. Um, loves to eat and drink. Uh, and Christ there is the one who offers um, hospitality. Mark has a low Christology. John, um, John's Christology is very, very high. Jesus is the pre-existing presence of God. It's not that it's disagreeing with the other Gospels. It's just highlighting it in a different way. Like John's symbol, if you didn't know, was the eagle. It's the eagle. Um, be, uh, one of the reasons why, it's the most sophisticated Greek. It's the highest Greek um, Christology. It's very complicated. Like and I have to say, I love the Gospel of John one of my favorites, but I really feel inadequate teaching a class on it, so I'm just hoping you guys don't figure that out. Because um, the Gospel of John, in one sense, is simple. I'll explain it in a second. In another sense, it's very complicated Greek and complicated theological ideas. And the way he tells the story, you could read it at a, like a um, grade school level and kind of get the meaning. Or for the fifth hundredth time that you read it, you realize, oh, that's what he's saying. It's really kind of complicated. And it's different than the other Gospels, because the other Gospels, um, John has rapid fire movement. Um, the actions in John is short and rapid fire, one after another. Jesus will uh, um, do this and this and this, but then he'll stop and get into a conversation, a dialogue. And if he talks about... He, the dialogues, there aren't too many of them, but it's on like baptism or um, love or the bread of life. If he talks about the bread of life or love, you know it's going to be a couple chapters. So when, like at Mass, when we get to uh, John and he starts talking about love, it's four weeks before we get off the subject of love. Um, certain key issues, Jesus talks a lot about. And then he goes back to rapid fire. Um, if you had a red letter Bible, you'd realize it because it'd be these huge blocks of um, red and then quick, fast pace again. Usually in the other Gospels, like Jesus says something, the Pharisees show up and um, Jesus gives them this one liner and they, uh, Jesus says something like, um, so, uh, who knows what they're, and um, Jesus, they say to Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about. He answers something back, and they say, we hate you, and walk off. Um, John has a different narrative technique. It's not rapid fire. It's more like a Greek symposium, a lecture back and forth. So um, the thing about it is, you have to be committed to try and figure out what Jesus is saying. Because if you just read it, like, oh, okay, da 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 Like, I'll give you an example. Um, at one point, and they're all pretty funny. Once you see it, you realize, oh, I really don't understand what's going on. So we'll just pretend Mrs. Lodge is G. Well, is is the disciple. So Andrew and Philip come to Jesus and says, the Greeks want to talk to you. Do you have time to talk to the Greeks? And Jesus says, um, Jesus says. Uh, um, if a grain of wheat dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But now is the hour of the Son of Man. <laughs> so, does that mean you have ten minutes or not? <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. Um, but the problem is, like, so many times we hear that and you kind of think, oh, okay, Jesus, it's, you know, grain of wheat must die. That didn't answer the question. And let, so you have to say, well, what does he mean? It does mean something. I'm excited to get to that. Um, 
he does have time to talk to the Greeks, but he's going to talk to them through the Eucharist after his resurrection. That's what he's saying. Um, but you have to kind of figure it out. Or, um, you know, I love, we'll get into this one next week. Um, when he says, woman, it is not my hour uh, at the wedding of Cana. Like, who talks to their mother like that? <laughs> but he's actually really saying something. Or um, they'll ask Jesus a question about bread. And Jesus replies, if you do the works of my father, you will not see eternal life. I'm oh, sorry, if you don't do the works of my father, you won't see eternal life. Does that mean you have bread or don't have bread? Um, what it really means, what he's saying is, bread is a commitment to doing the will of God. That the Eucharist is a verb. That's what he's trying to say. But you don't really get it unless you can see the entire gospel. Um, and I'll explain this in a sec. Well, I'll explain it right now then. So one of the things about the Gospel of John, it's written in what's called a chiastic structure. So uh, a chiastic structure is, it's like a pyramid. Whatever on this side is also on this side of the Gospel. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I could, I really could. But it is amazing how, like, this phrase will be here, the exact phrase, or a very similar phrase over here. And you can pick it up, same phraseology all the way through. Does that make sense? Um, carrying on this side, water on this side, water on this side, ta -ta 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 -ta. the very top is chapter 6 where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. A chiastic structure is how ancient Greeks um, wrote things. Like we always, you know, put it at the bottom of the sentence, bottom of the letter, you know, um, how are you? I am fine. Um, da -ta 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 -ta. By the way, I'm suing you for five million dollars. <laughs> um, you know, that, Greeks put it in the center and there's a reflection. But not only that, like the Old Testament has a lot of chiastic structures. We're just not aware of it, so you know what part is the most important. But the point being is this. To understand what Jesus meant like it when he says, woman, it is not my hour, you have to know what's going, you have to see the reflection part and add it up. When Jesus says this over here, it's not going to be clear like when it's my hour. You have to add up, and he says it like, I think 12 times about his hour. You have to add up, I'm not quite sure of that. Yeah, you have to add up all of them and then it hits you. Oh, that's what he means. It just hits you like a ton of breath. That's what he's talking about. Um, it is just amazing. Oh, or love or anything else. When he gives these odd replies back, you just have to keep track of it. Because John, he is like an, I heard an eagle uh, circles and then goes in wider and wider, wider circles as it elevates. I don't know if that's true. I'm telling you that. Just let me have my <laughs> illusions. Um, so as the eagle circles, it can see more and more of the landscape. Same thing with John. Whatever, it keeps circling. John, like Matthew, he wants to use hundreds of prophecies of the Old Testament and prove Jesus is the Christ. John actually uses a handful of symbols and keeps repeating them. But to understand what the symbol means, you just can't take that one answer. You have to take all of the answers and add them up. Does that make sense? No. No, it doesn't? <laughs> um, I don't know how else I can explain. How many people didn't understand that? Okay, then I'll go over it again. Um, so when Jesus gives a reply, pay attention to the reply, but like, he loves, he loves, there's certain key words, flesh, water, love, bread, um, uh, hour. He, ha he has a handful of symbols that he uses over and over and over and again. If you want to know what his reply means, what he's saying, you have to know all the replies and add them up. Um, I know, it's, yes? Um, who told you that? Yeah. Where? Um, by Mary Wax. 
Um, are you talking about Revelation? Well, let, me, let me put this. John was the gospel that was last written. But the problem with that is that, well, that is true. So let's say um, I, let's say I don't know how to write, which the vast majority wouldn't, but you're a scribe. John would have had told the story over and over again, and he has all these, I'll explain this in a second, devices so that you can memorize the story. It's like the gospel of Luke. You can memorize it really easy. It's 10 meals. The Gospel of John, I'll get to this in a second. It's easy to memorize because it's basically seven signs. You know all seven signs and all the signs have a theme to it. It's easy to see the whole thing. So it was written so that you could memorize it, you know, that you can memorize the stories. But we have ancient copies and nowhere does it say, you know, the gospel according to some anonymous source. Mm -hmm. It's always John, it's always the same, and um, there's no proof of that. There's proof that it was edited over the years and refined. There's a little bit of proof there. So, yeah, there's always been editing of the gospels and perfecting it, um, not over the years, but in the early church. That, yeah, that, that would be true. But the basic formula, we have no proof that it's not from John. In fact, we have proof it is from John because John the Apostle had a disciple, um, I'm forgetting his name right now, and then um, Irene, no, uh, yeah, Irenaeus was his disciple, so it was his uh, dis disciple of his disciple. And Irenaeus says it was John who wrote it. Okay. And so, no, there'd be somebody else who was inscribing it. That The Greek is so sophisticated. <coughs> it probably was beyond John. Okay. So John probably did have a scribe mm -hmm. okay. that was writing it. Okay. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. But no, I, there's no proof of that. I, before I'd say something like that, I'd want proof. Okay, thank you. There's proof to the opposite. So there is some themes in the Gospel, gospel of John. And one is... Um, sorry, donut got in there. Um... <laughs> One, one is this. The Gospel of John is very liturgical. And by liturgical, do you guys know what I mean or do I have to define that? Okay, it's very liturgical. <coughs> to understand the Gospel of John, you really have to know Jewish liturgy. So partly in this class, I'm going to explain some of the Jewish rites. And to understand Catholic liturgy, you have to understand Jewish rites. So... Um, John knows a lot about Jewish liturgy and weaves it into the Bible. It would be impossible to understand some of the meaning of John if you didn't have a Jewish Catholic liturgical history. He uses many of the feasts and rituals uh, to explain that Jesus is both king and um, high priest. At the wedding of Canaan, John knows ritual procedures. Um, John makes these references to Jesus as the high priest, and he makes references like, there is the Lamb of God, or these tiny little details that if you know ancient Jewish literature, or even Catholic liturgy, you could figure out why that's in the gospel. John is a liturgist. Um, there's such a significant role of liturgy in the gospel. Um, I think I've heard several former Protestant ministers say that uh, they just didn't understand large sections of the Gospel of John because they didn't know liturgy. So they just simply skipped over those passages for years when they'd preach. They'd just skip over because I don't know what he's talking about. You have to know Catholic liturgy. Like, even when it says, um, in English it'll say, he dwelt among us. What it really says is he tabernacled among us. Then you'd have to know what the word tabernacle means. Um, or let's say, let's say, for example, none of us had ever heard of marriage, didn't know anything about the right of marriage. You would have a hard time understanding what's going on at the wedding of Cana if you didn't understand uh, Jewish wedding rituals. If you didn't know anything about the Eucharist, then you're not gonna, you're gonna have a hard time uh, with Jesus talking about the bread of life. 
So two ministers, they did say to us, when they were preaching like the Bread of Life series, they just didn't understand it. Well, yeah, because they don't understand anything about um, the sacraments. And these little tiny details matter. Like um, at one point, you'll repeat this several times, when Jesus, when he has uh, bread, he'll say he, his eyes looked up to heaven, or he looks up to heaven. Why does he say that? Well, you have to know a little Jewish liturgy, such as the high priest, when he's making a sacrifice, he's obligated at one point to look, his eyes to look up to heaven. If you're all Jewish, you know, oh, it's saying Jesus is the high priest. Does that make sense? So in this class, we're kind of going to go over a lot of ritual because it's kind of woven in there. Or even that little thing, if you know the Catholic Mass and the rubrics, when the priest holds the um, bread and says, and he took bread and gave thanks, technically at that point, the priest is supposed to look up to heaven. Why? It's in the Gospel of John. I mean, well, actually, there are other Gospels too. But that's what the high priest does at the sacrifice of the lamb. And if you know these little tiny things, you think, oh, he's acting it out. There's all these clues. My only point being is that John is very liturgical. Twice, um, John the Baptist will say, behold, there's the Lamb of God. Well, if you didn't know anything about liturgy, you really wouldn't know what he's saying. You know, you'd think, oh, you know, he's saying Jesus is like a lamb. Like, you're such a lamb. You know, gentle and fluffy or something. Um, <laughs> that's not what he's saying. Um, you know, um, what is oh, so when it says lamb, maybe I'll explain that real quick. Um, not only were the Jews waiting for the Messiah, they were waiting for God to send us the Lamb of God. Just real brief. Um, Abraham, when he makes a sacrifice, we'll go over this later, um, when he takes Isaac to sacrifice, and we'll go this, um, he says God will provide the lamb. Well, technically God didn't at that sacrifice. It was a ram that was sacrificed. So when uh, Jews blow the shofar, it's to remind God, not only call it worship, but to remind God, send, we're still waiting for the lamb of God. Um, so, when John the Baptist twice says, there is the Lamb of God, they were expecting the Lamb of God to be a lamb. But when he says Lamb of God, he's pointing the Lamb of God to be a person who's going to take away the sins of the world and unite uh, humanity. Well, if you didn't know anything about liturgy, you would just think he says, Jesus is just a sweet lamb. Or in the book of Revelation, you, Book of Revelation, you have what, it's a, what is at the center of heaven? A slain Lamb of God, standing, which gets into some bit of liturgy there. But um, all these little things kind of mean something. And I'm only mentioning because it brings out the point that, wow, this class is not only going to be on John, but kind of a little bit on a lot of liturgy. Or it keeps mentioning that Jesus it has this temple theme, the new temple, that you know there'll be a new Moses, a new Passover, a new Exodus, a new temple where all people are welcomed. And it will be a light to the world, not just to Jews. The second temple that Herod built, it wasn't light. It was massive corruption. So you have this temple theology that's very liturgical. So John uses Exodus and Levitical imagery. Also, you have this kind of new creation theme. Not only did Jews look for the new temple that was going to be built, um, but a new creation. Isaiah promised a new heaven, a new earth. And inside the temple, if you could go inside the temple where the Holy of Holies is, they painted all these um, uh, fruit trees on it and pomegranates because it mimics the Garden of Eden. We're waiting to return to the Garden of Eden. In the Gospel of John, there's all these hints that Jesus is bringing us back to the garden. Um, Jesus will start the recreation of Genesis. So those liturgical themes, those Genesis themes uh, in liturgy, it's hidden in the Gospel of John. We're just going to unpack it. And just FYI, I was wearing a, a white um, chasuble that has the Lamb of God in the heart of it, right? And then it has these pomegranates around it. And so somebody, like I love when people notice symbols. They said, why would there be pomegranates on your chasuble? 
And why? Because in the Holy of Holies, it's a return to the Garden of Eden. Pomegranates are a sign of the Garden of Eden. Um, so, does that make sense? The Lamb of God is going to bring recreation. You have all these little symbols that when you read the Gospel of John the first time, you probably don't notice. And then there's this prophecy, which ho hopefully everybody knows, um, that the Messiah will be the new Moses. So not only are we doing Jewish liturgy and Catholic liturgy, but it's making this claim that Jesus is the new Moses, the prophet. Um, Moses delivered people from the land of death. Christ will deliver all people from death. Moses parted the water and walked through them. Christ will walk over the waters. He's going to do something even better. Um, Moses gave the Passover. Christ will give the new Passover. Moses told about the Lamb of God. Christ will be the Lamb of God. Um, Moses prayed for the manna. Christ will be the manna. Moses prayed for the flesh from heaven. Christ will be give us his resurrected flesh. Moses celebrated the wedding between God and humanity at Sinai. Christ will also start a new wedding. Moses gave them flowing water. Christ will say, I am flowing water. Moses gave them instructions to build the temple. Christ will say, I am the temple. All those are liturgical imageries. It'd be really hard to understand the Gospel of Luke, sorry, John without knowing liturgical imagery. And the structure of John um, is expressed in liturgy. And what I mean by that is this. So raise your hand again if I lose you. But um, the, how do you say the word covenant or testament, like we call it the New Testament? That means covenant, same word. How you say covenant in Hebrew is to cut seven. Seven means a, a covenant, uh, more than a contract this binding between you and God. So the Old Testament is a series of covenants. And the liturgical number in Judaism is seven. Seven means this contract with God. So there's seven is used a lot in Judaism. There's seven feasts. There's seven branches of the menorah. Um, seven is very Jewish. So John loves the number seven. The whole um, Testament is based on the number seven. So there's seven sevens in the Gospel of John. But the key main sevens are seven signs, seven I am, seven I am answers, seven witnesses. When John gets into a dialogue back and forth, and this is a minor thing, but it just shows how technical John is. When John gets into an argument back and forth with somebody, guess how many times there's a back and forth? Seven. Oh, you guys are brilliant. Seven. <laughs> um, there's seven feasts in the gospel. There's seven I am statements. That is, you know, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection of life. I am the way, truth, and the life. I am the true vine. The first half of the gospel of John is called the book of signs. The book of signs is, remember when I said there's no miracles in the gospel of John? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's no miracles. You know what John calls them? Signs. And the first half of the gospel is seven signs, chapters 1 through 19. So that's really easy. Like, all you have to do is memorize all seven signs. And just to let you know, I really do. Um, like, I like to pray because I'm weird. I skip over it. 49 Hail Marys between noon and 5 o'clock. And so I pray for different things. The seven virtues of the Old Testament, seven virtues of the New Testament. Um, and sometimes, because I just like the numbers, I, I pray the seven I am's. That's the second half of the Gospel of John. Sometimes I'll pray one Hail Mary for the first seven signs that I can live them out. After a while, it's really easy. You know, like the first half of the Gospel of John is so easy to memorize because it's seven signs. The second half is sometimes called the Book of Glory. That deals with Christ's death and resurrection. Um, so really, the largest part is the seven signs. Um, John lists them. Just, we're gonna, so most of this class is going over uh, the seven signs. So I'll say, okay, we're going to go over the first sign. So usually there's a sign, then a dialogue, maybe another dialogue, then a sign, then a dialogue, then a sign. So the dialogue and the sign kind of go together. Um, but the first one is, we'll go over this later. 
the changing of water into wine at Cana, the healing of the royal son's official from death, the healing of the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethsaida, the feeding of the 5,000 walking on water, healing of the uh, blind man at the pool of Salaam, raising of Lazarus from the dead. So we're going to kind of cut the class up into signs, but why does John not use the word miracle? Why does he use the word sign? Because Moses did. Moses never caused those miracles. Mo Moses calls them sign. The parting of sea, the water from the rock, the manna, they're all signs. Um, so he picks up this um, very Jewish understanding. Now, like in the Gospel of Matthew, Christ does 37 miracles. Uh, Jesus in John doesn't do too many. He really just does seven. Uh, because it's not Christ, John will say, oh, Christ did a lot more than that, but I only want to go over these with you so you can understand. So the thing about the sign in the Old Testament is that a sign demands that you make a decision. John, John loves the idea that fundamentally in your life you have to make a choice. A sign will happen, and then some people will decide to follow Christ, and some people will not. So um, this is odd. There's a lack of moral rules in John. John is more like a novel where you figure out and it changes your opinion. John does not give, okay, now I want you to obey these 27 rules. Um, the problem is most people don't, don't go deep enough into the signs. Um, there's this point where you have to make a choice and wrestle with the sign. You know, right from the beginning, John will say you either choose light or darkness. Um, but he calls them signs. Sometimes in your Bible it will be called works. Signs and works are the same thing. The idea is that the sign is supposed to lead to some sort of action. So John downplays the idea of miracles, of this supernatural wowie firework. Uh, the reason why is that, um, you know, if, if you see a big miracle in the sky, you can say, oh, that's great. But it doesn't demand anything out of you. You just have to be a spectator of the uh, uh, Miracle. Does that make sense? A sign means, oh, I have to either commit or not commit. So, like, when you're driving home to Boise and you see a sign that says Boise, 50 miles, you don't stop the sign and hug the sign and say, oh, it's so good to be home. Um, John does that with his miracles, his signs. You're not supposed to stop at the sign. You're supposed to, the sign points to something further. The same way some people respond to traffic signs and other people don't. Um, the idea is that these signs happen to lead us into a direction. Um, so, just, so once again, Jewish liturgies and Catholic liturgies, the very structure of seven is a liturgical number. Um, but not only that, the Gospel of John is sometimes called the sacramental gospel, and it's called also sometimes the Catholic gospel because there's so much sacramental theology. That's not to say like what the rest of the gospels are Protestant gospels, uh -huh. but the gospel of John, it talks a lot about the sacraments, especially baptism and Eucharist, uh, the seven sacraments. His longest discussion is being born from above and the bread of life. Um, and in the end, um, John will say, uh, greater works than these that we will do greater works than Christ just did. How could we do greater works than the flow of the best wine or the rising of the dead or giving sight to the blind or giving the bread of life? How we're gonna do greater works is the sacraments. All those are demonstrations of the sacrament. So even like St. Augustine said, the signs in the Gospel of John are types that point to the sacraments. The early church considered the Gospel of John signs as pointing to the sacrament. So remember, sacraments are not things that we do uh, for God. Sacraments are things that God does for us. So um, I just think it's kind of interesting. In the early church, uh, we know this, that one of the uh, ways they would catechize new people as Catholics is they've used the Gospel of John to explain the sacraments. So, like, it, it's very liturgical, very sacramental. That's just theme number one. Theme number two is the logos, Greek philosophy. Um, 
John uses Greek philosoph philosophical words. He's very sophisticated. Um, you know, in all honesty, I'm not putting John, but the Gospel of Mark, it's struck. It seems to be written at like a second grade writing level. The Greek is um, Jesus went to the market. Jesus da da da. Really simple, simple, simple sentences. Does that make sense? And um, it's not that it doesn't have a theology, but it's very simple. John, he's whoever wrote it. I mean, I know the Gospel of John. Whoever did the Greek writing is very sophisticated in the Greek. Some of the toughest, most complicated Greek. Um, and one of the words, I, you should know this, one of the themes is logos. And if you read it in English, unfortunately it'll say the word, the, sorry, the logos was God, right? The logos is God. Oh, sorry, I forgot. They'll say the word was with God. And logos does mean word, but it means a lot more than that. Um, Logos technically is a um, stoic philosophical term. And just real quick, they believe that there is this fiery light substance, the Greek philosophers did, that called the logos. It's where we get the word logic, logos, logic. Does that make sense? It can mean word, but it, what they believed is that the logos was this divine intelligence that rules creation. And if you're smart, if you're a scientist, you can see the fingerprints of the logos, the divine logic. Does that make sense? And so is a Greek philosophical term. We'll get into this later. But John doesn't say, just use the word word. He uses a Greek philosophical term. So clearly, John is very Jewish, but he also knows a lot of Greek philosophy. Third thing, John really cares about love. He, that's one of his favorite words that he keeps going over and over again. Like, if you go to a football game, you know, there's some, always some, so, sorry to say this, idiot, holding up a sign that says, John 3.16. Great. You know what it is. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. I like it, don't get me wrong. But um, it shows God is not indifferent to the world. The seven signs and the discourses are expressions of God's love. Jesus' death is um, pictured as this expression of love. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. When we hear that in English, sometimes a lot of people interpret the so as uh, how much God loved the world and that emotionally we should love each other a lot. But in Greek... Uh, the so, he so loved the world, is how God loves the world. The way God saved the world is by <laughs> sacrificial love. So we're supposed to save others with sacrificial love. So when I see those signs at football games, I always wonder if they really know what they're holding up. Does it mean that they're going to sacrifice their life in love for other people? Or does it just mean God loves me? Um, <laughs> How when Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. How did Christ, how did the, the Father send Christ? Not to condemn, but to show selfless love. And there's this whole thing in decision, decision making psychology. Um, it's very interesting if you're into that decision making psychology. But if you want people to might make a decision, you know what they found out? If you shame people, they will not change. You can shame people all you want, and they don't change. Shame and guilt are different things. Shame doesn't change the world. The ch church is sent to the world not to condemn and sh shame people, but to save them through our sacrificial love that we've consumed from Christ. So in John, you have this question in the background, what is love? Love for John is not emotional. It's not even a religious belief. It's self-sacrificing love. Um, a lot of times from the Enlightenment, um, there's this increasing thing, I think, um, people want to define faith as academic knowledge, you know, and especially, like, I'm not against canon law, but you find some people who love to quote canon law. In my opinion, equating faith with knowledge is really about power. Knowledge is power, and if you have this religious knowledge, you so show superiority. But in John, 
evil has always this feeling of religious superiority to others, which leads to the abuse of power. Um, so my only point being is that um, what love is a huge theme in the Gospel of John, but it is self-sacrificing love. There's a story about Teresa of um, Avila where once uh, Christ appears to her and Christ starts talking to her and sh suddenly she realizes that it's the devil and she says, ah, oh, you are Satan. And he says, how did you know? And he, she said, no wounds. Uh, isn't that a great, like, yeah. real love, it has wounds. Oh, uh, yes. Do you think that, that could have been influenced to some extent, that John could have been, he had to be tremendously influenced, uh, because uh, as I understand it, he was the only apostle that we know that was at the foot of the cross. So he was there, he was there witnessing right at the foot of the cross to the ultimate sacrifice. So that... I, that, that had to make a tremendous impression on him, so I would have, I would guess that, that that's why that's reflected in his gospel. Yeah, that's one of the hints. Yeah, good job. Did you hear what Jim said? No. Like, well, we don't know it was John. It doesn't say John. It says the beloved disciple. We think but um, the well, beloved disciple. What's that? Because then he turned. Yeah, but it, it, just about the sacrificial love. In John, only in John's gospel do you have, it's always women. <coughs> but, you know, the women are the ones that st st stuck through the crucifixion of Christ. The 12 apostles ran off. The only one who didn't run off was the beloved disciple. So for him, yeah, he, there's all these like little hints like that throughout the gospel that that's what love is. The bad news is this. If you're caught up into the world, you can believe God is love, but if you're caught in, up into the world of punishments and rewards, who's in and who's out, um, you're not going to like this God who believes in self-sacrificing love. If you're caught up into, no offense, any millennials that are here, that God loves me, you're not going to like the God that demands that we sacrifice for other people. That's what real love looks like. So John, he's going to have a bunch of hints that um, he loves talking about love. Jesus loves talking about love in the Gospel of John. Um, so then it gets into the question, well, who is John writing for? What community? John clearly is writing to a different audience than the synoptic communities. John's gospel, or John's community is sometimes called the community of the beloved or the beloved community. So who are they? We really don't know. But the text itself gives some hints. Clearly, it's written to Jews. Um, Clearly, it's written to Gentiles. Um, it's written to Jews who didn't know Hebrew, by the way, because he translates the Hebrew back into the Greek and then sometimes explains the Jewish customs because he's, reading, he's obviously writing to Jews and Gentiles. But um, do you guys know who the scenes are? Is that a no? Raise your hand if you don't know who the scenes are. Okay. So the scenes, um, have you heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah. The scenes, I'll explain to you there. The scenes are the ones who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, this kind of community of monks. And this very, very well-known biblical scholar, Raymond Brown, he writes his commentaries that if you look in the Gospel of John, you can see a lot of hints of the scene community. The scene community, they were disgusted at the excesses of uh, the temple priests and how corrupt they were. Um, the scenes, they were contrarians. They were very concerned, uh, they're against normal society. Uh, they're very concerned about the coming of Christ. They took vows of celibacy. They, um, at, like Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls, they had all these scrolls listing out all the prophecies of Christ so they wouldn't miss them. They were very concerned about the abuses of power. They were also a little anti authoritarian because religion and politics had become so corrupt. They were like this community of monks that emphasized the needs for purity and prayer. In the Qumran community, they had all these uh, water rituals, uh, flowing water so they could constantly purify themselves. Their life was basically rites of purification, prayer, and trying to get ready for the coming of the Christ. So why do we think there was all these converts from the Essene community into John's community. 
Well, there's all these little hints. Like the Gospel of John, um, John the Baptist starts in the desert, the same area as the scenes are. Um, twice, John the Baptist points out Jesus as the Lamb of God, and his disciples start to follow Jesus. So the beloved community was made up of followers who are of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, um, he has a lot of parallels to the scenes. His clothing, uh, we'll get into the scenes in a second, I'm going to explain more, but wow, that's a really good theory. The way they greeted each other, the same places Jesus lived, is all a scene communities. Um, so these who wrote out, tried to write out all what the prophecies were, seem to be connected with the Gospel of John. Also, so the Samaritans play a big role in John. So that's another hint about the origin of the Gospel of John, was how John treats the hated Samaritans. The Samaritans were shunned by Orthodox priests and the Pharisees in Jerusalem. Um, the Samaritans were both politically and religiously persecuted. They too tend to be very anti-authoritarian. And at the end of the story, the Samaritans were moved to follow Jesus in the Gospel of John. They get converted to Christianity before any other large group in the Gospel of John. So I said in the Gospel of John, which groups were converted first? You'd say the Samaritans. And that's a surprise because they were hated. So the question is, well, were they part of the uh, beloved community? And if you notice just with those groups, the other theme in the Gospel of John is the Gospel of John tends to be very anti-authoritarian. Um, there's always this kind of fear and disgust at the corruption of politics and religious leaders in John. The story of the man born blind, the parents are literally afraid of the leaders of religion. You have this constant theme of questioning and abuse from a religious authority. Well, that would be the scene's outlook, that would be the Samaritan's outlook, but why were they so anti-authoritarian? I just want to get into this as a background, if you don't mind, because uh, it'll help you understand why John is anti-authoritarian, very concerned about the temple. So a little background might help about the corruption of the high priest and the political leaders. So remember the Greeks under Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquers the world, he even overtakes Judea. And Alexander dies and his successors take over. Those are called the uh, Seleucids. The Seleucids, they try the same tactic of Alexander. Alexander wants to unify his vast empire by basically forcing people to accept the Greek language and Greek culture. So the uh, Seleucids, they attack Jerusalem, its temple, they suppress Jewish and Samaritan religious uh, observances and impose Greek practices. They even put a statue of Zeus in the temple, and they have prostitutes in the temple of God. And if you know the story of Maccabees, this rural priest and his five sons start the Maccabean revolt against the Greek, against Greek culture, and against those lawless Jews who capitulated with the Greeks. There's this bloody revolution, it's called the Maccabean revolt, they drive out the Greeks, and this guy Judas Maccabee, he's which name means the Jewish hammer. He's the son who takes over. And he starts this dynasty called the Hasmonean dynasty of high priests. Now, the Roman Empire is expanding at this time, in 139. And the Hasmoneans, they go to the Roman Senate and they form this alliance. And they say, you know, you watch, we'll form this political alliance with each other. Later, the Romans use this to take over jo jo Judea, but they work out this deal for Rome so that Judas, uh, the son, can be named both king and high priest of Israel, of Judea. Well, this violates Jewish laws. The high priest isn't allowed to have murder or blood on his hands, which Judas did. Judas makes this power play. Uh, yeah, they revolted against the Greeks, but he wants to assume all power. So now he's high priest and king. And he imprisons his mother to starve to death, and he imprisons his brothers. And when he dies, his wife, Salome, 
frees the brother, marries one of the brothers named Alexander um, uh, Yanus. And Alexander, he's named high priest and king, which also violates Jewish law. Um, but what you see is those who fought for religious purity, once they have power, really no longer care about religious purity. The only thing they care about is um, power, and they use religion for the same thing. And so I have found that over and over again. Sometimes the people who claim to be the most orthodox, really it's a big smoke screen. Does that make sense? So Alexander, he in, expands his territory and he invades the Samaritans, he destroys their temple, um, he expands the territory to this Idumea, um, this non-Jewish people, and he forces them to convert to Judaism in name only, just to unify his country. Now notice, he's using the same tactics as the Greeks. Alexander is a Greek name. Um, now religion is no longer about following the will of God, but conformity to the state. This is the very thing that started the Maccabean revolt. And now Alexander is doing the same thing. Um, well, uh, Alexander, um, um, I think I'm, um, he, he was the brother who was released by Salome. Um, and as I said, he marries, he becomes a high priest. But he doesn't really care about religion. So the fe on the Feast of Tabernacles, and remember that because later Jesus is going to make a big deal about something on that being light and flowing water at the Feast of Tabernacles. On the Feast of Tabernacles, it happens in October, the people gather with these uh, palm branches with citrons on it. Citrons are like an ancient lemon. And Alexander goes to the temple. He takes water from the Pool of Salaam, Remember that? That's going to come up as one of the miracles. And he, they take it back, and, and their people are waving. And what he's supposed to do as high priest is renew the temple by pouring water all over the altar. But he doesn't really care about religion. He doesn't care about liturgy. So he doesn't know what he's doing, and he takes the water, and he just pours it on the ground because he doesn't really care about liturgy. And the people are incensed at the one after another, not really, you know, the fakeness of religion. So they take their citrons and they start to throw it at him. Remember, he's high priest and king. He is not going to, he gets so angry, he orders his soldiers to kill 3,000 pilgrims. Um, and then this um, Jews rebel against the high priest and king Alexander. And so they go to the Seleucid kings, the ones that, the Greeks, that they kicked out, Demetrius, King Demetrius, and they form this alliance and said, we'll let you into the city, we'll back you, just get rid of this horrible high priest. So Al uh, Demetrius comes with his armies there at the Jerusalem gates. Then the rebels decide, you know, it's better to have a corrupt high priest and king than be under the controls of the Greeks again. So they turn at the last minute and they beg Alexander for forgiveness. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, it's all written on the Push Peshar Nahum. It describes what Alexander did to the rebels. Alexander um, has this feast with all his concubines and he has his soldiers crucify 300 of the rebels. And not only that, but to add pay, pain to them, when they're on the cross, he has their children and wives slaughtered before their eyes. While he's feasting with his orgy, with his concubine. <laughs> if you're a devout Jew, yeah, you would have problems with that. Um, my only point being is that just understand how corrupt politics and religion had become. So when Christ says, my kingdom is not here. He's not saying my kingdom is in heaven and yours is here below. That, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying, Christ is the king. Christ is the high priest. John's going to make that point. What he's saying is the way Jerusalem works, that's not how his kingdom works. The way religion works under the high priest is not how his religion works. So you can understand why the Essenes and the Samaritans 
considered the political system and the priests enormously corrupt. Uh, they were ruthless. So what the, uh, and anybody who threatened their power, they were also ruthless with. So you can understand why the Essenes wanted to go into the desert, away from everything. It was started by this one priest, Zadok, who was um, um, disgusted at the uh, corruption. He goes into the desert, calls other people, and it, they take vows of celibacy. And night and day they prayed for the coming of the... Celibacy is very unusual in Judaism. Um, and they prayed night and day for the coming of the Messiah. They kept meticulous scrolls of his prophecy. Um, they did these rites of purification. Um, they were called seekers of the law, and they were disgusted at other people who capitulated. Um, just a little bit about them. Um, they had communal dining, so they had plates and all this other stuff, but they dwelled in tents. There's no personal apartments. And they had this scriptorium where they wrote all the, the history, the corruption of the temple and politics, wrote out all the prophecies. The thing they cared about most was all these texts. And none of the texts had personal writings. All of it was designed to uh, be aware of the coming of Christ. Um, now, they didn't see how one person could fulfill all that, be both high priest and king and prophet. So they assumed there had to be two of them. But the main thing the scenes were concerned about was um, purity in diet, in water. Water is a huge symbol in the Gospel of John. The scenes, purification rites with water, is a huge symbol. They'd greet each other as children of light or sons of the Zedok, the, high, the priest. Well, in the prologue, what does John call the followers of Christ? Children of light. The very greeting of the scenes. So you have a lot of these similar things of water and children of light and purity. The problem is the scenes um, were very exclusive. Uh, they're very you had to be of royal blood, priestly not royal blood, priestly blood. They um, would not welcome any sick and lame among them. They did have houses to care for the poor in Bethany. Um, they had one in Jerusalem where Jesus probably had the Last Supper, was in, probably in a scene kind of like St. Vincent de Paul house. Um, but they were known for their, um, their neat prayer and purity, but um, Jesus wouldn't have got along with the scenes because Jesus welcomed the lame and the sinner. Does that make sense? And Jesus was not that exclusive. But John the Baptist comes from the same reason, obsessed with water miracles, obsessed with the coming of Christ, strict diet, if you notice the gospel. He was son of a priest, and you have the same greetings. Um, so, yeah, there's probably this Essene thing. Um, now, later, um, Herod, the Romans will come in because, um, I just think it's funny, um, when Alexander dies, uh, two of the brothers fight to be high priest and king, the mother, uh, oh, he dies, the mother takes over. And the mother is actually a great ruler. She is a fantastic ruler. And like Josephus, the historian says, she, how fantastic she was despite being a woman. <laughs> um, and when she dies, two of her sons fight, uh, cause a civil war. And the Romans, remember they made the slides come in and overtake the country because there is a civil war. And they elect Herod, who technically is not Jew. He, that area of Idomea, where they forced conversions, his dad was at, but never practicing. His mother was an Arab, and he didn't care about religion as well either. So you have all this incredible corruption. Then you have the Pharisees, and the Pharisees, um, they also, you know, their way of um, avoiding corruption is not by purity, but more by creating a lot of rules and regulations. You know, as you know, that doesn't really change the world either. So what I want to end with in this discussion, part of the reason why I like the Gospel of John is, yes, because of its Jewish liturgy, Catholic liturgy, sacramentality, love, Greek philosophy, but also the Gospel of John has this kind of contrarian, anti-authority appeal. I know. Just imagine being Catholic at a time in which, what if you found out 
the bishops were incompetent. Just imagine it. <laughs> um, worse than incompetent bishops, what if you find out that there was evil in our religion? What if you lived in a country in which the world's political system is falling apart? What would your reaction be? Some people are like the seeds, and they say, well, we'll just separate ourselves, and oh, we'll have only the pure in our... That's the seeds. The Pharisees go the other way, saying, well, we'll have rules. We'll have rules upon rules upon rules to control people. Um, you know that doesn't work either. Um, and so Jesus in the Gospel of John, his idea is to go mystical. The Gospel of John is called the mystical gospel. It deals with love and mysticism. It does have a role for Peter. I'm going to say that for the last. Where Peter symbolizes the institutional church. Um, so John respects Peter, but its emphasis is on the beloved disciple. The one who is not concerned with becoming isolationists or rules. The beloved disciple is concerned about following Christ in liturgy, where you become a mystic. You use liturgy, baptism, Eucharist, to become, you go to the mystical core of your religion. One of the reasons why I like John is that that's his reaction to corruption. And in this time period, I'm sorry when we show massively incompetent bishops and corruption within the church, what should your reaction be? That's partly why I wanted to do the Gospel of John. John's answer is, go to the mystical core of your religion. And John, you go through it, through prayer and sacraments. So, um, questions? Uh, this is just introduction. Yeah. So, chicken or the egg question. Which came first, um, liturgy? Or liturgy. Scripture? Liturgy. Liturgy came before scripture. So, when they canonized scripture, they used liturgy as a criteria for that it actually developed like I think of John chapter 6 was that sort of wording being used in the mass yes and then it was incorporated in the scripture well like bread of life the bread of life language that goes to Moses yeah. so that you know and that that's a chicken and egg because what came first Passover or the Lamb of God at the same time what came first Passover or the living bread? Same time. So they developed Yes, except, remember, li the Catholic Mass happened before the Gospel of John was written. Right. So. And before any of the letters. Oh, no, the letters, letters came first, then the Gospels. Before Mass? Oh, yeah, before Mass. The, the Mass was first, then the letters. Yeah. He just got it because that's what how they cel we celebrate it. Yeah, Greg. Um, no, the disciples were not part of the scene, except two of John's. If you notice, when John says, "Behold, the Lamb of God," Andrew, I'm pretty sure it's Andrew, starts following Jesus. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, he starts so. John's followers literally become Jesus' followers. And it's highly sus suspicious that some of John's followers were pulled from the scenes, that John was probably in a scene. Mary's greeting with angels is this an a scene. Like there's just so many a scene connections. How do you spell? E S S I'm not a good E N E E S. -S, -E -S. Yeah, yes, I, I think somebody <laughs> Questions? Okay, so so next, uh, well, anyhow, let me pause. Just make sure, does this make sense to you or get overwhelmed or did I do too much or not enough? Yes. Too much? <laughs> oh, oh, ha <laughs> ha. Um, oh, yes, Artie. Is there any way that we can arrange this so we can hear back here, like especially with the good questions, the band is well, I'll try and repeat questions. That's my fault. I should repeat questions. So, okay, make sure I repeat questions. 
So I'll keep to, So next time, I'm not sure, I've never taught it this class, so uh, next time we want to go over the prologue, and if I'm really lucky, the first sign, and the first sign is the wedding of Cana. And like, think about reading the Gospel of John uh, during the week. It's really not that hard. If you want a commentary, um, the commentary I like is the Catholic... Um, study guide for the Bible. I think this is pretty good. So. Where do you get that at? I don't know where I got it from. I ordered it online from, I think, Ignatius Press. Yes, Ignatius Press. So. The Ignatius Catholic Study Bible, Gospel of John. All right, God bless you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be, 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 and it sh